Welcome to the 8th Lunch and Learn session on Operational Excellence. This session's topic is Productivity versus Busy Work. Understanding how to differentiate between productive work and busy work. This session is sponsored by Jamestown Community College Workforce Readiness. The session is facilitated by Max Krug from Future State Engineering. We hope that you enjoy the session. Okay, good day everyone. Thank you for joining session eight of our series on operational excellence. Today's session is improving productivity and really understanding how to differentiate between productive work and what we call busy work. Our goal in our operational excellence is to do more with the resources we have, right? We're not looking to lay off people as a result of improvements. We really want to destroy the culture, right? Do improvement and then lay off people. We're really looking to um, improve output with the resources we have so the business can grow without having to add additional expense of more people and being able to hire additional people. So probably the number one issue I hear when I go into companies is we can't find good people. So this is really important in how we make people more productive since finding new people, good people is hard to do, right? Let's make our current workforce more productive. So as always, we go to our necessary conditions. So today's session is really going to focus on the two bottom ones here, how to establish the mindset to achieve sustainable improvement and how to establish a positive change in the organizational culture. So our weekly Dilbert cartoon, what is not being productive? So Dilbert's at his computer and says, let's see what's on my to-do list for today. Let's see useless meetings, busy work, making misleading PowerPoint slides and another useless meeting. So the dog bird says, how was your productivity today? And Dilbert says, I know you're mocking me. So how many people on the call today have this as their daily to-do list, right? Where we have all these things that we're doing, but we're really not being productive and converting um, our inputs into useful outputs. So let's talk about what is productivity to start with. So I looked for definitions. I sort of modified the definition of what I think productivity is. So it's really a measure of effectiveness of a resource in converting inputs into useful outputs. So there's two important points here. We talked before the difference between effectiveness and efficiency. So I'm talking about effectiveness here of the resource and its useful outputs. So remember from, I think it was session three, we defined what are useful outputs, right? They're the necessary and sufficient inputs as defined by the next step in the process. So it starts with the customer. They define the requirements of the output of the process. That output determines what needs to be done in the process to achieve those outputs. The process then defines the inputs that are required and then the inputs go back to the previous step. So you can look at this as a supply chain or you can look at it as a value stream. It doesn't matter. We want to understand is what's the needs of the next step in the process and making sure that we're giver, giving all the necessary and sufficient requirements to that next step. And again, necessary means what's required to do their job. Sufficient means it's the right quality. So we define productivity. So now let's talk about busy work. So busy work is an activity that is undertaken past time and to stay busy but in and of itself has no actual value. So we call that non-value added activities for the customer. And remember the customer can be the next step in the process. So let's define non-value added. So it's any activity that doesn't convert the product or service one step closer to what the customer is demanding. It does not add, the, add to the market form or function or is not necessary. It's activities that the external customer is not willing to pay for and it's activities that should be eliminated, simplified, reduced, or integrated. So this is where we gain the productivity from is reducing these non-value added activities or this busy work. So a lot of companies have the culture, if I don't have anything to do, make sure I look busy because I don't want to get laid off if I'm not busy all the time. So people find all these activities to do that show that they're busy, 
but they're not productive. So I see it all the time. So I've done several projects where people were busy all day long, but did, what did they actually accomplish? Okay, so if you don't accomplish a lot towards moving the product or service closer to the customer needs, then you're not being productive. So a lot of people are busy, but they're not productive. So what are contributors to lost productivity? So there's many contributors. So one that I see is lack of sufficient problem solving skills. So if you're not good at problem solving, what happens is people come up with solutions before they actually define what the problem is. And then they put in solutions to what they think the problem is. And of course it doesn't solve the problem and it creates more steps in the process. So one of my rules of thumb in problem solving is if the activity that you decide to put in place to solve the problem is another non-value added step, you didn't get to the root cause. So for example, I see all the time, oh, we'll put another inspection step in place because the person didn't make the product correct or the, didn't do the activity correct. So we'll do an inspection to make sure that what they did was correct. That's a non-value added step. So now we're just adding more complexity into the process. The root cause of that is not doing sufficient problem solving. Next is reactive decision making. Okay, so we want to be proactive in our decision making, but of course problems come up all day, we're swimming in problems, and so we're reacting to those problems in our decision making, and that's really um, causing two things. Constant daily interruptions, so I start working on something and I get interrupted, right? Then I have to deal with that issue, then I start again on what I was working on, get interrupted. Okay, so we wanna stop those daily interruptions because they're extremely unproductive. Third is incapable and unstable processes. So if you're not familiar with process control, the basis here is we need processes to be capable and stable. So capable means we can predict what the outcome is gonna be. Stable means that it's, it meets our customer needs. So there's many contributing factors to this. One is poorly written or lack of standard operating procedures. Okay, so either the procedure doesn't describe how the work should be done, or it's not aligned with actually how, right, the, the process is being performed. Okay, or there's lack or ineffective training. So we have a procedure, but people aren't trained to the procedure. Okay, so we're working on okay, now that there's an issue with, we put in new procedures, nobody follows them. Okay, so that's a cultural issue. So how do we get people to follow those procedures? We talked about that in previous sessions with the Socratic method to get buy-in and to get their buy-in to be able to process the new way and then put the feedback mechanism in place so we can hold them accountable to the new process. Next is bad multitasking. So bad multitasking is when we do task switching. So we switch from one task to another before we finish a task. So for example, if you're working in your office and you're working on some task and you get a phone call that interrupts you and you take that phone call, right? So now I've switched to another task. Oh, and then in the meantime, since I'm on my phone, I'll check Facebook and then I'll respond to a couple text messages, right? That's examples of bad multitasking. So what's that compared to good multitasking? So there is something called good multitasking Good multitasking is where we complete a task and then before we start the next task, so think about making dinner, right? So I prepare the meal. So as I'm preparing the meal, I don't wanna be multitasking. Then I gotta put it in the oven for 45 minutes. So I put the meal in the oven. So good multitasking is I can complete a task in the next 45 minutes without disrupting the the preparation of the meal process. What I don't want to do is start a task that's going to take me two hours and I start do 45 minutes, then I go eat dinner and then come back and start the task, right? So good multitasking, we want to define tasks and complete them before, within the time that we have available between tasks. Okay, another one is ineffective or too many meetings. 
And then a third, and the next one is creating data or reports that are not utilized. So a lot of times I see companies that are generating all this data, gathering all this information, generating all these reports, and nobody's looking at them, okay? So these are major contributors that we see. How many of these do you have in your own company? So if you have those in your own company, there's huge opportunity to expose what we call hidden capacity. So what is hidden capacity? It's capacity that is not easily identified by someone with an untrained eye. It's like, oh, that person's busy all day, right? But are they productive? So hidden capacity is defined as busy work that doesn't convert what the person's doing into useful outputs. Okay, so it's all this task that we're doing and we talked about some of the contributors to that in a previous slide. So how do we expose hidden capacity? So the hidden capacity is more than you actually can imagine in your company. One, develop problem solving skills. So have people that are good problem solvers so they get to the root cause and we actually eliminate the problem without adding extra steps in the process and actually simplifying the process in the meantime. Eliminate unnecessary process outputs. So there's activities that you're doing that the next person or anyone downstream of you aren't using, stop doing those. Improve insufficient process input. So if you're getting information from people or a product or anything that you're receiving from the previous step in the process is it correct, go back and make sure we get it correct, right? We don't want the person in the next step of the process to have to do rework because something wasn't done correct in the previous step. Not multitasking. So turn off all notifications on your phones or your computer, right? Turn off email notifications, app notifications, messaging, and stop those interruptions. Create blocks of time for various activities. So now we're starting to talk about creating some standard work. So for example, we're talking about, okay, address emails from first thing in the morning till 8.30, then from 11.30 to 12, and then 4.30 to 5. Okay, so create blocks of time when you're gonna do various activities and stay on task. Establish office hours within the organization. So we've done this in a couple of companies where the departments that are heavily loaded Right, they have quiet time. So typically between like 8.30 and 11.30, nobody's allowed to interrupt them. Okay? And then they put their phones on do not disturb. And then also in the afternoon, we do from like 1.30 to 3.30, right? So they get blocks of time where they're uninterrupted. Right, that's a cultural, huge cultural change. Then, Next is a practice effective meeting technique. So little thing we call weight. So practice weight. So what is weight? We'll talk about what is weight. So weight stands for why am I talking? So here's a guideline for better meetings. And so we start at the top, why am I talking? If we look at the first box on the left-hand side, I have something really important to say and or I have a strong opinion to share. If no, why am I talking? If yes, the second question is, is it time to do that? If no, why am I talking? If yes, be concise, okay? On the left-hand side, why am I talking? I have an on-topic contribution. If yes, is it my turn? If yes, did someone make this contribution already? If no, be concise, okay? If I have, a, if I have an on-topic contribution, if no, then why am I talking? If yes, if it's my turn, if it's not my turn, why am I talking? Did someone already make this contribution? If they did, why am I talking? Okay, so we wanna have meetings that are short, concise, and productive. Okay, so it's not uncommon to take two hour, so this I think I talked in the past, this one company, they had an hour and a half production meeting. It's now 15 minutes. And what do we talk about? Exceptions only. Right? We're not going to talk about every job going through the shop. We're going to talk about the jobs that are in trouble. And as we start to stabilize things, the number of jobs that are in trouble go down. Right? So the amount of time we spend talking about jobs that are in trouble gets less and less and less. And so 
they used to have this meeting in the morning with like 12 managers for an hour and a half. Now it's 15 minutes. So you can imagine we freed up an hour and 15 minutes time 12 manager. How much more time did we free up? And we moved the meeting to 2.45. Quitting time is 3 o'clock. And amazing, every meeting finishes at 3 o'clock. Okay, so designing the system so that we can build into the process. Okay, so a quick overview of improving productivity. First of all, the objective is to produce more, to produce more with the resources you have, not to add more resources. Okay, second, what are the tips for improving productivity? Eliminate the busy work. When we eliminate the busy work, we're gonna expose hidden capacity. Don't focus on reducing the value added time. Focus on reducing, eliminating, simplifying, integrating non-value added activities. So remember our focus, do what should be done, don't do what shouldn't be done. So I'm saying here, don't focus on the value added time, focus on the non-value added time. That's where the leverage is. We need to change the mindset from working harder to working smarter. So the goal isn't to keep everybody busy. The goal is to keep everybody productive. It's two different mindsets, okay? So we can be much more productive and work half the time, okay? So it's not uncommon that we free up half the people's time from eliminating the busy work. But in some cultures, right, if you're not busy, then, oh, let's get looked at as, as a negative and I'm gonna get laid off. Okay, so we need to change that paradigm. Use the Socratic method to achieve buy-in and change behaviors. So we want to, we need people to do something different, right? Of course, people are creatures of habit. They don't want to do something different. So to get them to do something different, we need to get them to see it's their idea, right? So we use that Socratic method to coach them, ask questions, give them information to change their mindset. Once we change the mindset, then we can change the behaviors. We can't change the behaviors unless we change the mindset first. Next, be great problem solvers, right? Drive to the root cause. So if we're great problem solvers, we're actually gonna simplify processes and reduce the rework, okay? Freeing up tons of excess capacity, okay? So that's the end of the session today. I'll turn it over to Elena. She can talk about upcoming events and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Max. I want to thank JCC's Workforce Readiness and Future State Engineering for hosting today's events. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed it. We've got our last Lunch and Learn series coming up next Wednesday, June 17th, and it's um, the topic is developing an employee skills matrix. Max, would you like to maybe say a few words about that? Yep. So it's going to be a build on today's session because today we talked about um, being able to free up capacity for people. So if we free up the capacity, we want to be able to move them into areas where they can be more productive or we have areas that are overloaded. So what we don't want to do is move people that are untrained into areas that they need help, right? Then we're just going to create more problems. Okay. So the employee skills matrix is a key part of being able to transfer capacity from one area to another. Okay, so that's what the topic is going to be next week. Great. Thank you, Max. And then we have two eight-hour online workshops coming up that we're, um, that JCC is hosting, and we truly hope that you take advantage of it, especially if you want to take a deeper dive into the topics that we've been talking about over the past eight weeks. The first workshop is Introduction to Operational Excellence, and that will be on June 23rd, 25th, June 30th and July 2nd, and that's from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, and if you'd like to register for that, please contact Kathleen Martell at JCC and she can get you registered. And the second workshop is creating and sustaining a quality culture with accountability. And for that are July 16th, July 21st, 23rd, and July 28th. And that one is from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And again, if you would like to register, please contact Kathleen Martell and she can get you registered for those. Um, and they actually are offered at a deep discount. Um, they are $149 for each 
eight hour workshop, which is a fantastic price. So hopefully people can take advantage of, of these, these sessions. Thank you very much. So at this point, we'll take uh, questions. Hello, Max. This is Chuck. Hey, Chuck. I have a, uh, a paradigm shift type question for you. Since the paradigm of the past has always been to keep people busy, to focus on utilization and things of that nature, with including having KPIs in place defined by top management that really stress utilization, what are some strategies that the organization can use to, uh, to drive away from that culture and drive towards more productivity? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Chuck's right. A lot of times the KPIs are set up around how productive are people. And remember when we did the, what's the difference between effectiveness and efficiency? So really we need to train leadership on what does effectiveness mean, right? We got to get leadership involved, right? If we don't get the leadership in the right mindset, we're not going to change it. Okay. So we need leadership aligned, right? We need that buy-in to understand what does effectiveness mean? And then we need to recalibrate those KPIs that are causing the wrong behaviors, right? So that's, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult to do that, right? You're changing the whole culture of the organization. And like I said, when we start a series, that culture is the hardest thing to change. So we got to start with education. We need to be coaching. We can learn how to coach up to our, our supervisors. If, whatever position you're in the company. So using the Socratic method, there's ways to do that. Also, we want to coach that to our peers and our subordinates, right? So Socratic method is an important part of changing that mindset. But I mean, education's the key and getting the right KPIs in place to change the behaviors. But that's a hard, extremely hard thing to do. Hopefully I answered your question, Chuck. Yep, thanks, Max. It's always been a difficult one and you know, potentially maybe passing along the uh, invites to the, the eight hour sessions coming up to your upper level management team might be a good yes. way to get things kicked off. Are there any other questions? Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Max, for some great information. And we hope to see you all next week and spread the word about um, the last lunch and learn session next week, as well as those online classes, the opportunity to take those at a very discounted rate. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day. Okay, thanks everyone.